This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. What was the intention to shift the narrative to the national elections from your side? And what is your personal intention for running for parliament and pursuing something which I think is very difficult, a very contested election during an extreme disaster that we're living through? So I'm sorry to start this very, very with a very huge question, but I think it's the only way to ask you about your group and about yourself entering politics? Well, I was listening to your podcasts and I've been following <clears throat> for a while. Um, and you describe your, yourself and your podcast as a storyteller in, in a way. And, and I'm a storyteller as well. So I'll, I'll start with, with my short story and, and why I'm doing this. Um, I grew up, I was born, I think we were born the same year. I was born in May 82. I checked actually. You're uh, one year younger than me. And you're luckier than me. You're born in Hamra. Yes. I'm born in Austin, Texas. Okay. <laughs> I prefer Hamra. You prefer Hamra. I haven't been to Texas, yeah. but um, I can. I get that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was born in 82, uh, a few months before the Israeli invasion in Hamra, mm. in, in divided Beirut, mm. um, in a family of a human rights activist and a lawyer, my, my mother, and a father who for 30 years was a war reporter, a journalist with Agence France Presse. Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up in that um, environment of uh, walking in Beirut with activist parents, mm -hmm. um, really uh, a love for justice, for law, for Lebanon and for Beirut. And this is the upbringing that I had. Mm -hmm. um, and from early on, I was aware of our rights and our privileges as ci citizens. And my first um, the first time I took part in any pol political activity was at age six in 1988 oh, wow. with my mother, Nadal Adhami, and her friends, whom I'm sure many of you, many of you know and I'm sure you, you'd, you'd recognize today, who uh, started a campaign uh, to end the war. The campaign was called Al Amid Hu Al Hal. It was the Remo Edde campaign. Yes, of course. That, sorry, this is your mom. This is my mom. Oh, wow. Uh, with Paul Ashar, with Amin al Basha, oh. the late uh, artist and friend, um, and many others uh, whose names I escape me now. But I was the little girl in these pictures, uh, uh, distributing flyers uh, across Beirut and uh, crossing the demarcation line and at the Madhaf uh, that's, checkpoint. That's you. That's me. You know, good, because I try to do my research and then I obviously have my own limits. I'm glad you're starting it this way. So you are already a, a natural storyteller because you're telling a storyteller a better story <laughs> that I could never imagine. I, I'm, I didn't know that's you. I didn't know that that's... I only I knew something, maybe now it sounds superficial, but it resonated with me, that you had memories of a Beirut that has completely disappeared. And that's, I think, our generation that saw Ras Beirut and Hamra, what it was before the Civil War, and parts of it that faded during the Civil War, but we're old enough to know. The Wimpy Cafe. Yes. Motka. Mm -hmm. I think I heard you once mention Cafe Express. Yes, I, I, th that was me. I, I learned walking yeah. in the uh, playground or uh, courtyard of Cafe Express. Uh, Mom and Dad would take me um, and you know make me attend their intellectual meetings in Motka and Wimpy Cafe de Paris. So I grew up in that, on that street. Um, and walking and liking the city and appreciating the diversity of what that city offered, even in times of war, was really my, my upbringing. So I'm going to guess that seeing a city that you love as a child, even during its darkest hours, 
is something that is extremely special to you. And I, now I know a little more about you. My memories of Hamra and Ras Beirut are a little older. It's mostly the early 90s. Mm-hmm. But it's still the same. It's what we don't see anymore. And permit me to interrupt my own question. Um, is there a cosmopolitanism that you're seeing f- fading from this part of not just Lebanon, but this region? And are you trying to preserve some of that, whether that's intentional or not, mm-hmm. that you've you've seen maybe a part of Beirut erode? And this is a slow erosion, but it's really taken its toll in the last few years. What I can say to that is that in in the early mid in the mid nineties, being a, a teenager, uh, we used to walk in the city without phones, without maps, mm. without cell phones, and there was a sense of uh, freedom and safety. Um, and I don't remember the city being as dark and as scary and as dirty and uh, neglected as yeah. uh, just after the war. So I think. Uh, as a shortcut, as a short response to what you're saying, what these people have done in the last 30 years, I've witnessed, I mean, coming out from the war, um, witnessing the city and experiencing the city was more pleasant than experiencing the city today, and especially Hamra and Ras Beirut. And this is not, and I don't want this to be understood as a uh, um, discriminatory uh, yeah. narrative. Um, and I, I, the blame for me is not on displaced or refugees or um, um, people who are who have become homeless. I blame the failed state and the political parties, the warlords who have led us here. This is a very rich introduction to a very difficult discussion. Uh, I'm going to pick and choose, with your permission, the things that I'd like to explore the most. And you told me something which I really enjoyed. Right before we started, you said, in translation, give me what you've got. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think you were actually saying, hit me hard. I'm like, (laughs) I won't. I'll be gentle. I'll be kind. I'll try. I think Beirut Medinati is trying its best to send a message that is two things at once. And and you tell me if I'm seeing this right or Mm -hmm. wrong. The local is important. It's not an accident that a lot of the members were at least initially leaning towards urban planning Mm -hmm. and urban planning plus politics. Mm -hmm. The three Munas were in Beirut, Medina, Mm -hmm. Munal Halla, Mm -hmm. who was one of my first episodes, one of my most enjoyable exchanges. Muna Fawaz, who was on not too long ago, actually, reflecting on October 17, and someone I know from AUB, Munal Harib, who's never been on the podcast. These are very important pillars in urban mm-hmm. planning. And it makes sense that this is a political party, or at least a group in its inception, that would have that as the source, or let's say the, the resource necessary to improve conditions across the city. And it seems like it's a primarily AUB-oriented or Ras Beirut-oriented yearning for something that it should. It, it's a dysfunctional version of the Beirut that we know and probably the Beirut that they remember better, just in terms of age. And it's also, at least in its inception, a group that deliberately avoided larger issues that had less to do with municipal governance mm-hmm. and more to do with national or even regional problems that impact Lebanon. And that may have provided it a solid footing for municipal elections, but not so solid footing when it came to trying to resonate further. Mm -hmm. So I'm being as diplomatic as possible and trying to unpack the journey from municipal to national elections. And whether or not you think of it that way or if I'm getting anything wrong in its initial construct and and where it is right now. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what I can say to that is, I'll tell you my involvement and mm. my story with, with Beirut Madinati and Madinati, and I'll connect it to the larger question that you're p- posing here. Um, in 
we all know about the protests that began in 2011. Mm. Uh, I wasn't here. I was in, in the UK, so I only witnessed them through uh, online or yeah. journals and what people said. Um, in, in 2013, together with, uh, with colleagues um, and friends from the neighborhood, from Ras Beirut, and also architects and urban planners, as you mentioned, and especially my dear friend, Mona Halla and others, we um, came together to protect a very important cultural coastal landscape, Dali mm-hmm. uh, the Dali of Raushe. And, and you succeeded. And we succeeded. Yeah. Um, and I'm one of the founding members of, of that effort, mm. along, along with other others. At that point, um, this was before the uh, You Stink 2015 movement. Mm. Mm. And, and I remember very, uh, very well discussions that we were having, and I was present at the Rauda Cafe. It was prob- probably in May 2015. Um, and, and I remember the date because I, I was leaving, uh, uh, I was traveling that same summer to UPenn to study again uh, <laughs> landscape architecture, a fourth degree. And I remember that we decided and we, we had this uh, dream and, and we said we should run for municipal elections. Pe- people like us should, we want to work in, in the municipality of Beirut. We have ideas, we mm-hmm. have plans, we know what to do and how to achieve it. I'm glad you're taking me back to pre stinky years. So it's really born from 2011 and that initial victory, that there's an, there was a passion that you could see turning yes. into politics. Yes, I mean, Dalie, we began in 2013 with a small group of people. And then uh, all these names that you mentioned mm. started, uh, you know, uh, coming in and out uh, into the campaign and uh, playing the role that everyone could play at the time to succeed in stopping that project. Mm, mm. Uh, and I'll, uh, when I leave, I'll, I, I, I brought with me a publication from that from that time uh, about Dalie. And this is exactly what made me uh, decide to run seven or seven years later this year. So I think Madinati, Beirut Madinati began with that uh, um, uh, with these multiple victories, whether it's the Dalia campaign in 2013, but also the Fuad al but Save Fuad Butros Highway, yes, uh, right. which I was also involved in with uh, colleagues and friends such as Abdel Halim Jabir, mm-hmm. Antoine mm-hmm. Atalla, or Rajan Jim, and many others. Yeah. So we are part of these. You know, we're, we're the group um, who is um, who was active and who succeeded with numbers, with facts, with courage to say no and to say no to to two projects that are a lot of people call us romantics, you know, <laughs> your, uh, your, your heritage people, your architects. But actually what we did, we stopped corruption projects. Yeah. Stopping the Fuad Butros Highway was saying no to corruption of the CDR and the Ministry of yeah. Transportation and stopping the Dalie destruction of that monu- landscape and monument which belongs to you, to me and to future generations is saying no to corruption as well. So we we sensed we, we were able to uh, to make corruption tangible for us and activists. And this is, I think, the strength of what we did. I appreciate that you're going so local to one specific location, and that's where the moment shines best, that you're able to succeed in a landscape and terrain that's very difficult to navigate, but you found a way to do it. I remember those years actually cheering you on for the Fuad Butros Highway that would have knocked down too much of Tibet, um, Hekme uh, and, and even mm-hmm. into Marm Khayel. Yes, yes. That kind of, uh, it's like the last stretch of Beirut that you would want knocked down for, a un, for an unnecessary highway. Mm-hmm. And you succeeded in that. And of course, Delhi Roshi. So I, I appreciate that you're honing in on two very important achievements. Do you think that that in itself, or that, that that's where the strength lies for civil society? More than trying to take it beyond what is a very important and noble mission. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out where successes mm-hmm. meet walls mm-hmm. in this journey. And because the municipal election did not turn out in favor mm-hmm. of Beirut Medinity, and that's, I know that's years later, but that's after you sting crisis and you would maybe assume that the appeal would be wider. Yes. But it didn't translate into politics in in terms of uh, 
actual power. Power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything there from the very local to the municipal that you would see where the wall is exactly? I think the fight, I mean, contextually, the fight is not like any other activist fight in, in Berlin, let's say, against gentrification mm. or uh, a neighborhood like in, in New York City. The, ex the sole existence of these two projects that might seem local for uh, the unexperienced eye uh, is corruption, clientelism, and a failed, failed planning of a state. Mm. Um, I mean, transportation is about getting people from point A to point B and is about connecting neighborhoods. Yeah. Uh, so in the absence of that planning institution and body, this experience, my experience in the Dalia campaign and in Fuad Butros and as an activist and during th those same years as someone who have who has tried to work within the municipality with mm, them. Mm, I've mm. tried. We have tried. I think all of us. The reason why, in my humble opinion, and I can't speak to the group, uh, we, we, we turned from professionals, from experts, well, uh, um, ac academics to activists at least for me, is because we we hit this wall with with these institutions. And I remember mm. I remember attending meetings in 2011 at the municipality with, for instance, uh, donors or funders like Région Ile de France um, and the municipality of Beirut had the cooperation, an agreement, a mem memorandum of agreement to work on public transportation, street lighting, yes. urban mobility. And the wall that we would hit every time after years of and thousands of money is that within the municipality, yes. these are the discussions. Yes. Yeah. Um, and this is when the, the, the two projects, Fuad Butros and Dalie, mm. became apparent to us. So we were. We, we, we transformed from working from within, from being professionals to being activists and whistleblowers to our friends who were outside. And we were like, what what to do? You know, yeah. let's act. Let's let's, you know, and we were equipped with numbers and studies and the know how and expertise. So that's why I say for for Dalie, it's a, an expert citizen uh, site lover led campaign that succeeded. Same for Fuad Butros. Let me then ask you a more delicate question and trying to get one step further into this. In my eyes, this seems to be a protest victory and that putting pressure on mediocrity mm -hmm. does sometimes work and that bad decisions, if they're, if they're expressed the right way to the right crowd, there may be enough pressure to actually not do something like the Butras Highway trying to appeal to a wider audience. And I know a lot has been said about that election. The election pursuit within municipal yes. votes and municipal journey mm -hmm. was not a victory. Mm -hmm. Although a lot has been said mm -hmm. about why and a lot has been said about thing, obstacles that may not be Beirut Medinati's burden. It could mm -hmm. be the way Lebanon has governed itself for too long. There's many community com communal anxiety reasons that can be thought of and maybe researched on for years and years and years and why Saad Hariri was not willing to mm -hmm. join forces and all mm -hmm. those internal discussions that didn't materialize. We can put that all aside. Just in terms of numbers, mm -hmm. could you explain why this movement could not capture enough voters to win municipal elections at a time where it was a very clear mm -hmm. choice between an ambitious group that wants to fix many problems and a sluggish group mm -hmm. that leans on inertia and gravity more than pursuit. I have a very direct answer, fear, voters mm. fear. Mm. And, and this is something that I encounter today. Um, why should we vote for you? I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm discussing my program, I'm discussing my bio, I'm telling you that I was injured in the protest, that I, I have, you know, I have foreign, I have a foreign passport, I could live anywhere, I have degrees from, I could live anywhere, but I want to be here to try and change things, and I love this place, so why wouldn't you trust me? Why would you trust them? So I think voter, we have voter fear. Voter mm. fear of an unknown figure will, will, will you know, this, the sectarian fears that I don't subscribe to. 
uh, as being, you know, the uh, the godmother. I mean, we're already entering another another. <laughs> we're going on tangents here, <laughs> you know. Taifa <laughs> Sunia, the fear of, you know, the godfather or the godmother or this idea of leadership, which is not leadership in my opinion. It's um, fabricated fear and fabricated narrative and fabricated ideas of leadership based on fear. I think that's an important word that can you can extrapolate that from municipal to national to maybe even regional concerns. But let me push you as much as I can on this. If you're insisting on that important factor, I'm assuming that what should have been a at least the municipal cause did not turn out in your favor, mm-hmm. in your group's favor. Mm-hmm. Why would the national journey be any easier? I'm going to just guess that fear outside of Beirut would be much more dramatic mm-hmm. than fear in a city that we both fully identify with. And there are some people that did vote for Beirut Medinity, but not the majority. But the people that voted for Beirut Medinity, I'm going to assume that they were the crowd that we both... I, it's the cosmopolitanism mm-hmm. of Ras Beirut primarily. Yeah. That does not necessarily work in other geographies. I agree. And, and I think this was, um, I won't say a mistake, but one of the lessons learned for the group. Mm. Again, I, I cannot talk on behalf, but from my own reading and my discussions and what I could follow up from from the diaspora, um, perhaps lack of expertise in running elections. We all hear of the famous Makanet mm. Intikhabiye, electoral machines, or Mafatih Intikhabiye, key, I don't know how to translate uh, that. Keys, keys, yeah, keys, well, yeah. keys to neighborhoods or keys to... I don't know how this key, would work. Electoral keys. Yeah, let's go with that. Electoral, electoral keys. keys. That's, that sounds, sounds nice. Good. That might be the title for the episode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or fear. Or, or fear. Or courage. <laughs> or courage. <laughs> you, you decide. Fear, courage, and keys. And keys. <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> Only one of those gets you into power. Yeah. No, no, I'm joking. But that's a lesson learned in in the translation from municipal to yes, national. Yes, and also the discourse, I would mm, add. Mm. Perhaps that, you you know, um, I am aware of my privilege, um, especially now, and from my privilege growing up. In, uh, and I'm not, I'm not ashamed of it. This is ashamed of it. This is me. And um, the difference is that I and my family, we've chosen to put this privilege to uh, at to the service of the city and the country and n- the national good. So I think going back to, to Beirut Medinati, perhaps the discourse did not appeal beyond a specific crowd. Mm. And this is a lesson. I think this was a lesson learned for them. And the lack of expertise in running elections, add, adding to that fear and the, the novelty of the discourse. I no uh, too many members of Beirut Medinati, now Medinati, and I know many members that were once part of it, mm-hmm. no longer part of it. And I think of these people as as either dear friends or they, their heart is definitely in the right place and they have the backing, the background and the, the tools. The research that has been done is so extensive mm-hmm. that I think a lot of these members are actually experts in mm-hmm. their field, their respective fields. Uh, there's one character I would run into all the time. I know he's not Beirut Medinati per se, but he was at least willing to dance politically with the group, and that's Gilbert Dumit. Mm-hmm. In 2018, those elections, and I think the the larger team was called Skeluna uh, Watani, and then you had Libeladi. Yeah. Right, that was mm-hmm. sort of there were members involved. Mm-hmm. So it's not a Beirut Medinati only mm-hmm. coalition, but there were many in there. Yes, and I would have the most frustrating conversations with this very gentle soul who's not necessarily running right now, but I think his heart is still in what's happening. And the frustration was always, if you're going to talk national, you have to address national issues, and that includes something that everyone is talking about today. Mm-hmm. Hezbollah. Yes. Everyone, I mean, and I, I don't necessarily trust every voice. Mm-hmm. Actually, probably the majority I, I wouldn't trust, but it has entered the discussion. Sure. And I think the volume at times is so high that I would 
want to hear other things too, not just this very important issue. But that said, there was a real hesitation to take on that burden. Mm -hmm. And I think for civil society to take the burden of geopolitical mm -hmm. <laughs> disaster is actually unfair. I don't think it's civil society's cause. But that said, entering national elections and parliament, mm -hmm. you're not really civil society anymore. Sure. So in that duration, mm -hmm. the first round in parliamentary elections, can you maybe maybe bring to life some of the the decisions taken to maybe not go down that road and then four years later everyone's on that road mm -hmm. and what whatever you can say on that reckoning perhaps that there's something about parliamentary elections that's just different mm -hmm. and i'm sorry to i don't mean to put any burden on you in particular no, it's more that fine. the way you see this journey sure. from 2018 until today well, again, I speak, um, this is my own reading, as I was in and out for, for travel reasons. From what I saw was that there was a momentum that, was, that happened in 2016, regardless of results, mm. um, and um, a realization that a lot of people wanted something different and that perhaps weren't voting because they didn't feel that they, didn't feel that they were being represented whether mm. in municip municipal elections or, or parliament necessarily. Um, and I think with um, the deterioration of things uh, nationally and locally, um, the uh, status quo was really be starting to be disrupt and disrupted and uh, um, um, confronted, not just in Beirut, but uh, nationally. And I, I'll take you back to the coastal issue, for instance, yeah. uh, in, in saying that after the success of the Dalia campaign, um, what initially began as a campaign, as a local campaign, with uh, the realization that it was one specific political group involved, we started having uh, people c c contact us from Adlon and from not Akkar, from Adlon, from Kfar Abida, from Biblos. Um, hey guys, we love the work that you've done. Can mm. you help us? We have the same issue. Mm. So we, we realized that the, um, the issues that we were dealing with uh, locally were actually all across the Lebanese coastline. Right, right, right. And we started having these friends and... So this is when, when people talk about decentralization, this is when the effort and the fight and the uh, realization that we need to do things differently began to decentralize. And I think this was overlapping with the uh, 2018 uh, elections. Mm. Um, and I think like any novice, uh, you know, uh, a beginner, I mean, we have to say that um, Beirut Madinati was a beginner in 2016. Mm. Uh, a lot of things shifted. Some people wanted to take that effort at a national level and enter into parliamentary elections. Others didn't. And so, you know, I think for me, the takeaway of that group is that they actually practice democracy. They vote, mm. they decide, mm. they stick to the decisions of the group, which is, you know, they're leading by example, really. Maybe the decisions aren't necessarily always the right ones to, uh, and don't appeal to everyone, but they, at least they stick to their own ethics and values, and they learn their lessons. Is, is there, and my understanding of what happened is an outsider's mm -hmm. understanding. I don't have any... It's really just hearsay that that was a that was a moment for this group to either move on mm -hmm. and learn and go again into parliamentary elections. And this is all before October 2019 yeah. mm -hmm. or to simply leave the group. Mm -hmm. And am I right in understanding what happened after that? Yes. Yeah. To my knowledge, what happened is that the group, the General Assembly, voted not to take part in elections mm. and asked those who did not agree to actually um, freeze or resign from the group or right. freeze their uh, membership and um, join whatever effort they saw fit. Uh, and perhaps indirectly, I, I wasn't that in, involved at the time, Beirut Madinati asked their supporters and their people who came to them for advice to, to uh, support that list or that list running in Beirut. I see. Um, it's, it's fascinating for me to learn this because mm -hmm. I think, and this is, maybe I'm speaking out of line here, I think there's an 
there's a certain not not prejudice that's not the right word mm -hmm. there's a lot of online hysteria mm -hmm. when it comes to certain groups in october 17 mm -hmm. and i think the two that get the most maybe perhaps at times unfair attack mm -hmm. are beirut medinity which is now medinity and uh memphis mm -hmm. on the other end of these attacks and I, I think these groups are complicated mm -hmm. and maybe there's an internal dynamic not everyone knows about. And my guessing is that Beirut Medinity had that and had that built in. Mm -hmm. So the reason I ask it also this way is the group that I, the, the, the individuals in that group that I saw in October 2019, underneath these tents where Beirut Medinity was listed, mm -hmm. they're not there anymore. Mm. And I found that to be I was always curious why they're not there right now mm -hmm. and I'm guessing this is just the journey that a group takes when it wants to pursue parliamentary elections mm -hmm. you're going to have those that simply don't want to go on that journey yes and I think this is a you know a natural path in in life in any relationship whether it's personal romantic mm. uh, family relationship or work uh, not everyone is on board there's mm. a there's a kind of a, a framework and a way of working that yeah. is in place and some people leave the boat and others join and again talking about myself i i joined i was always involved and supportive from the, the beginning um and then i joined briefly the decision making mm -hmm. um framework voting for a year and then I resigned from that effort because I couldn't follow up anymore. And the requirements was for members to be not to be absent for more than six months, which I couldn't uh, right. couldn't sustain for travel reasons. And then 2019, um, and that's maybe a segue to to back yes, back yeah. to me. Mm. 2019, um, I did not October 17th. I did not personally as Sarah. I did not want to exper experience yeah, the I'll revolution. Just, I'll put this here so that you don't get blocked by <laughs> water. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and for me, it is, a rev it is a cultural, social revolution. It's perhaps not yet an economic nor uh, a political revolution, but for me, it was a cultural revolution and it, it was a historic moment in our modern history. Um, I wanted to experience that moment not as a member of that group or the I other. See. I wanted I to experience that as a, cit a citizen on the street. You don't know this, but I ran into you three times. And I recognized you from a wedding we both attended. Although I, it was thousands of us, I think, at different times on the streets. And this was in Martyrs Square once. It was at the candlelit vigil. Mm -hmm. And I, I, kn I recognized you, but I didn't feel... Uh, I didn't feel like I could interrupt the moment and I decided to just sort of you were very visible during those protests and then I saw you more recently online because of these everyone is campaigning so you run into everyone who's campaigning yeah. online um, I know that you're a firm believer in the pursuits in the days following October 17 2019 mm -hmm. and I think that's safe to say that your current pursuit is that's a springboard at least for what you're doing i hope i'm not over speaking here but that's my guess that that moment is what brought you to parliamentary elections right now you're running in the most difficult district mm -hmm. i think for any group forget beirut medinity or medinity any group trying to win some votes in beirut too i wish them the best as much as you can elaborate on why there are 10,000 lists, <laughs> not 10,000, that why there are too many lists in this district from your side. Every group has its sort of stubbornness maybe mm -hmm. built in. Maybe compromise is not easy when everyone's under pressure. But why Beirut Medinity, Medinity decided to go alone? Not just in Beirut 2, in Beirut 1 and 2. And if I'm not mistaken, there's a, there are at least there are members running in another district mm -hmm. too in the south. In Saida. In Saida, yes. Saida is the Inhanya right. Zatari, yes. Right. So of the dozen or so members that are running, is it 13 in total? Did mm -hmm. I get that right? Why this is not part of a larger list? 
Okay. Anything you can say, and you can be as hard as you'd like on other groups if that's what you see fit. I really like to know from your side mm -hmm. why it didn't pan out. Mm -hmm. I'll be very honest and transparent because I think this is something that I am demanding from everyone, including the traditional parties. Um, I wasn't intending to to run in these elections um, simply because I disagree with this, this the electoral law mm. uh, as running on a sectarian seat. Now, I would like to say to everyone that I respect all religions and all sects. And I think, like our, our friend Nadim Shahad, oh, another sh friend I, I knew, in common. I knew you were going to say this, yes. I disagree with Nadim. <laughs> Nadim presents himself as, I'm a sectarian. Hello, I'm a sectarian. You get ready because he watches every episode. Hi, Nadim. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's actually right Hi, now. <laughs> he's really happy right now. Or really upset. Or both. <laughs> Um, so what I've learned from hanging out with Nadim, who's ah, a family oh. friend and a friend of my father's, and we were in London, we would take the number 19 bus from uh, him from work and me from LSC going back home, we would meet on the bus, uh, is that why wouldn't we look at the diversity of these uh, sects as, a, and I'm going to shock, as an, an economic asset for touristic events, for celebrations, for uh, if this reassures communities, if this brings people together, really brings people together. And here I really, I would like to quote this Aish al-Mushtarak, which is, this is, a, is an expression that I really can't hear, uh, <laughs> or Silm al-Ahli. Uh -huh. uh, yes. I mean, and it's not romantic or, or naive to say that we live, we live together. I mean, I've, I've, I, in, in going back to my childhood, going, attending school at Collège Protestant Français, and this is just after the Civil War, I really never knew who was what. And this is where I think, and I'm putting myself in your shoes now, you might say this is the Ras Beirut or a specific kind of a class thing. It's not. All my friends from, from that school growing up in the same years from different uh, social backgrounds, economic backgrounds, and uh, on a range and spectrum of being super conservative or very liberal, are non-sectarian. Yes, and I don't. I will not speak on Nadim Shahadi's behalf. <laughs> I mean, I he's one of my. I've learned so much from this one human being, and he's been on the podcast I think five times. Um, he's definitely carved out that that uh, that safe space, if you will, mm -hmm. for secularism and sectarianism. Mm -hmm. And I, I know the debate and I know that mm -hmm. I, I can imagine the conversations you had. I think I've had the same ones. Um, I won't, I'll try not to go in that direction too much other than I'll suggest something. And I think it's because the you said it at the beginning, it's the way the electoral, it's the way politics functions mm -hmm. in Lebanon, that you are running for a certain seat in a certain district, but that seat is a sectarian sure. seat. So there's, I mean, there are no Sunni bones in either one of us. But I didn't even know what, yeah, what sect you uh, you you're listed uh, as. I, I <laughs> so. once actually joked to a guest <laughs> that uh, I'm from Bikfaya, and I'm just you know the other shata. They're like, it took them a while. I'm like, come on, I'm joking. <laughs> so we're both. I know you as just a fellow Ras Beiruti. Mm -hmm. And you probably identify me that way too. Sure. And you are running in a district that is experiencing a very uncomfortable situation mm -hmm. that may not resonate with us, but it seems to resonate with a wider audience sure. in the, at least this district, if not across mm -hmm. Lebanon. So let's go down this road. Sure. With Nadim Shahadi sitting with <laughs> us, but listening in. Yeah. Um, is that part of the struggle in terms of trying to pursue politics in Beirut too? And does that have anything to do with Be with Beirut Medinati's decision to go it alone? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's any linking there. Yeah. But what can you say from that before we get too deep into Sunni anxiety? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what I can say is that... Uh, so going back to I didn't want to run, mm. and then I was convinced by a dear friend uh, at the National Bloc, Amin Isa. 
yeah. um, who so I had uh, Medina T called me and said we're preparing municipal and parliamentary elections would you like to join us in writing the program as an expert so mm. I said yes so I started working with them on developing and shifting the program their electoral program from a nas- from a municipal program to an, an, a national program a national campaign and during that time I was contacted by my friend Amin Isa asking me to run with them, with the National Bloc, um, as an MP candidate in Beirut too, on one of the Sunni seats. And actually, I want to thank uh, Amin, because he is the one, and I'll be uh, forever, uh, I'll remember him forever. He convinced me, if you want to change things, Sarah, you should run. It's not by opposing that law from the outside that you're going to change it. Who, who do you think would would change that law. You and me sitting outside and lobbying, fine, you, we can do that. But what about take, trying to take that shortcut? And for reasons that mm. are related to at the time, and it, this is not a blame or a judgment, um, they, the Nas- National Bloc did not give me a precise um, standpoint on the alliance or not with trad- with the Mu'arad that we know today, the Kateb or, or what I have see. you. So you were actually being pulled by both yes, ends, by yes, Medinati yes, and National yes. Bloc. Okay. And I chose oh. to run with Medinati because I know them better, mm. because I know their, their his, history. If you talk to any Beiruti, they know Beirut Medinati. And, and this is where I was surprised. If you talk to any Khudarje grocer in uh, Bashura, or a cab driver, they have heard of Beirut Medina, yeah. it resonates. Mm, mm. Um, and their process and their work and not just that, their achievements. I mean, they are people who have achieved not just, they've, they've, they've been very, very active with al Naqaba Tantafid. Yes. Um, yeah. And they've been very active in um, stopping the incinerator and leading yeah. the Tilef al Nifayet. So these guys, these friends, these uh, ladies, they have a track record of achievements, which convinces me. It, and <clears throat> that, that asset, which is, it's healthy to, it's, it's important to remember that Al Kitl al Watani is a recent return. So. It makes more sense anyway that Medinati would be better known just because of its participation. Mm-hmm. And Kitli is just back on the scene a few years ago. So I, I like that I'm able to understand why you would want to go with a crowd that you identify more with. And something else, you hinted at the Kate'ib mm-hmm. problem. Uh, did that have anything to do with why it's just not one unified list? I, I don't really know the reasons why certain groups... It's not just Medina too, sure. but why they're going alone in a journey that is stacked so high against mm-hmm. these individuals. Yeah, what I can say is that um, the net, I mean, I'll clarify, I have no, I respect every party's internal journey. And I think Kate'ib compares, compares to others is is commendable, but I don't think it's enough for me. And I'm not convinced by them today, let alone running perhaps with them or with a group that is uh, ha- has a, a coalition with them. Mm. This this doesn't mean that at parliament, I wouldn't be working with them if we have the same goal. Right. I think this is politics. At the end, we're not marrying someone. You're you know, working <laughs> with them. <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah. They don't have to, to check all your marks, that's, all your that's, boxes. That's a nice way of compromising, actually. Yeah. Exactly. But this is where, and I think compromise, I think perhaps what Medinati did, Medinati did not compromise on um, a framework that it was trying to um, instill for these elections. And I say that to their credit, to our credit, that they, we began an effort of uh, proposing ways of selecting candidates based on merit and achievement and gender diversity and social diversity and regional, even from within one district, uh, regional diversity and representation. And that these efforts were first met by uh, a big a big coalition of independent groups or new Saura groups I see. Uh, we- with welcoming arms. And then as uh, the e- electoral money and electoral machines and the pressure of we have now the rise of uh, platforms, which I mean, I, I can't really speak a lot to that, but this is a new factor that, you know, the Nahwa al-Watan and the Kulluna Irada think tank platforms with 
and perhaps their work is is commendable on many levels but i think they and you know their internal uh, fracture and they and their unclear connection with banks or political groups or the kataib and this might only be gossip again i mm. um this is just a reading was very dis- disruptive to the whole electoral formation of lists process then i mean it's not it's a rare opportunity to ask someone that was obviously you you had at least an ear if not you were directly involved uh is it at the end of the day that you're going to have a lot of lists in a in a district that is sought after mm-hmm. and in a in a and we'll get a bit into the communal sort mm-hmm. of issue and is it more to do with that than to do with something like national blocks relationship at times with certain members or or even the groups you mentioned the platforms mm-hmm. uh Kaluna Irata mm-hmm. and, and and uh that kind of platform and advocacy in the background because mm-hmm. uh, I I still don't it makes little okay so somebody who would think compromise is part of the journey mm-hmm. in a in a very contested region that all effort would be made to have one unified list and clearly that just never happened for Beirut too so if you could maybe point at one particular problem that you thought was the biggest and that there's just no compromising on it Beirut too for me three lists that are I don't know if, if we should say independent or Tahrir change or Saura, but there's clearly three lists that are different uh, from the others in, mm. in, in Beirut, Beirut too. And we have 10 lists, so we have three lists that are not part of the hidden other lists which are supported by uh, ex MP right, Senora yeah. mm-hmm. or Fahd al Hari, Baha al Hari, sorry. Uh, a lot of Hayiris, so I'm con- I've never confused. Met, I've never heard of Fahad. The architect. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Fahad came came uh, came up because of Dalia. Oh um, right, okay. He's one of the owners of the, of the site. Yeah. <laughs> um, not not running for elections. Not running for elections <laughs> yeah. yet. <laughs> Maybe in ten right. years. Maybe. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, a list of uh, misma mix mix nuts of different. Uh, families and which we all respect and and I think one thing I want I want to say is that for and that's getting into the Sunni fear for 30 years um, there was one if, if we want to talk about representation there was mm. one party representing this group yes. if, this, if yes. we want to describe this group as a community or as a sect or right and I think it's healthy that for the first time this group has the choice to reassess mm. Okay, what is what if we want to talk their terms and I don't necessarily abide to that, but I understand it and I read it. And if I'm if I'm running, I'm repre- I'm running to represent them and us, and I'm one of them as well. So don't we don't they have a right to choose something different? You know, somebody just actually yesterday I recorded an episode with Fuad Mersoumi mm-hmm. who's running for the same seat. Beirut to the Sunni seat. And he said something similar. He said that there is an opportunity to have that competition. I think that's the word he used, actually. So it is it is exactly, in a way, uh, a reflection that Mahzoumi mentioned, which is that this would have happened regardless of kate'ib or platforms that advocate, whatever, money mm-hmm. and or no money, sure. that you would have this happening in Beirut mm-hmm. too. Yes. Okay. Yes, I agree. And I, I was saying that for the first time in 30 years, the Sunni community has a, a, a choice um, to elect those who they believe represent them. And um, and this is a menu. I mean, it's a wide, it's a menu of uh, different different people from the conservative, the mm. less conservative, more left and more right, women, men, young, old, uh, experts, technocrats, uh, social workers, so I think this is, you know, for me at a larger, larger scale or looking at things, you know, history is is long. I mean, I I work in I work <laughs> I well work said. as an landscape <laughs> landscape architect. It's quite long. That's and, true. 
<laughs> and 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 time. I mean, I deal with time every day with with my work. Uh, we deal <laughs> with yes. geological time right. and changes, which is much larger is and longer than <laughs> Lebanese yes, problems right exactly. now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, so but that, that's a good perspective to have. So I think we are. Um, I mean, whether it's Tayar al-Mustaqbal or the other parties, the other parties for me are not really political parties. They're, I mean, mm. they have, despite, they have granted themselves national pardon at the end of the war, and they've continued being our decision makers. I like that you're saying that they're not political parties. Mm-hmm. Would that also include the other opposition groups that could not find common cause with, Be- with Medinati? So in, in other words, the the, uh, the groups the groups that mm-hmm. are not Nadim Jmeil mm-hmm. or Paula Yaoubian mm-hmm. or and I know Paula I keep saying I should these are Beirut one list so mm-hmm. I should be careful when I say that but it's the same I think it's the same problem in trying to find common cause mm-hmm. on one list Beirut two is just harder sure. but I can think of many other lists where they're opposition mm-hmm. and they hold the same principles sure. so what about those other lists that sure. is it that Beirut that Medinity has a built-in reputation and a structure and that it's an organized party and you don't see the need to work with a group that's just not that well structured mm-hmm. no no I, I don't think it's that I think specifically for Beirut too uh, there was decisions at, at many levels to, to be made and compromises that um, d- levels of compromise so you're you're unifying at what cost or uh, what are your red lines? Would mm. you just for the sake of unity, would you perhaps run with a candidate who might win because of the electoral calculations, who is against granting, uh, who is against women granting the nationality? Would we want? Is that the change that, with all respect, I mean, this is not personal. I, mm, mm. I. A lot of the candidates I know and I respect and others I don't know, and it's just about their political agenda. Uh, would we want to get people to parliament who might uh, perhaps uh, vote for Birri? Would we right, want to get right. people uh, to parliament who would, not, who would be pressured by their sects or religious leaders and who would not be in favor of lifting all immunities to continue with uh, mm-hmm. the investigation in the murder that happened in Beirut, the explosion? Yes. Uh, would we want to be represented by someone or a candidate who is not for lifting banking secrecy. Okay. So I think in the F, in the obsession of unity, which I think is a noble goal, um, and I understand the frustration and the deception of a lot of voters, but unity at what cost? Mm. Um, and I think, I mean, today I won't give any names because I wish everyone best of luck. And again, our fight is... Is, is, is them, is not us. And I think we are in a healthy, I mean, there's room for diversity, there's room for everyone. And we're not fighting each other, we just disagree on a few things and on the process. Um, and we respect democracy. And running, I mean, I have to say, I take the opportunity to say that groups like like Menfed or Beirut Madinati or other groups in other districts who have not been yeah. have been bullied I mm-hmm. mean have been bullied have been accused of spitting the Saura of killing Lebanon of and I think this is very immature and unfair and uh, it's limit I mean for me I would categorize that as bullying every political group or individual has the right to run its democracy it's yeah. the constitution so it's really about holding on to firm principles knowing that this is going to probably cause de- defeat in certain districts but that it's the principles that matter more than parliamentary elections or even an mp slot and I, did i get that right so there's a it's a there's a natural wall sort of in the selection process mm-hmm. and unless there's these important points and i like what you said earlier it's not a marriage it's a work relationship but that's once you're in parliament sure. prior to that you want to really be married to your partners in a more intimate way. And that means very important mm-hmm. key factors. And you you identified something, one thing, this very important, unsolved, horrible situation, women's right to nationality, or even things like 
in addition to passing down your nationality, LGBT rights, that those things emerged and that the mm-hmm. Beirut Medinity would not be willing to work with someone who doesn't stand alongside those principles. Did I get that right? Yeah, I think it's it's the the principles, the red lines that should not be crossed. And what kind of representation are we are we faking? I mean, are we faking are we faking it by saying we're running on one uh, program and one vision? And when we get to parliament, will we work together or will we hinder the work of one another? N- knowing mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. the uh, what we call the sulta or the traditional parties are run together, but have they what have they achieved you know, their unity has destroyed us their hukumat wahda watani has destroyed us has destroyed our country in the last couple of years or has uh, uh, accelerated the destruction and the collapse so i think we need to reassess these election after these elections this obsession with this unity i i'll ask one more question on this and then we'll get into your own current campaign and and what you're, you're really what you're fighting for uh is there anything to draw from 2018 that the forced unity among groups that don't work together right now didn't work, or at least worked in that Paulia Obien is the only visible success story from 2018, and that may not be why she won. She may have won with or without that kind of unity, mm-hmm. but you don't want to go down the same road that was taken in 2018. Is there anything there in the what didn't work then? And what you're doing now? I mean, I can I can only speak on behalf of, of Madinati, and again, I'm 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 just a friend of, of the yeah. group, so um, <laughs> I'll speak as a friend and as as a, as the as someone who's experiencing things right now in in this campaign. Um, I think Madinati has uh, learned that in order to to work nationally, it has to shift from a local effort to a national effort, mm. hence the change in, in name, hence the mm. uh, uh, adjustment of the electoral program, more boldness in terms of, you know, the sovereign uh, sovereign uh, question, Hezbollah question, and all the, you know, the, the, the big, the big uh, questions, mm. um, which, which brings me to say that, and we'll talk about that maybe later, that politics is everything. Yeah. It's not just uh, Hezbollah, what do foreign policy, or you know, if, if, uh, the co- the financial committee. It's it's our everyday life. So I think this what this group, this party is doing is 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 uh, shifting from a Be- a Med- a Beirut uh, based uh, um, movement to uh, a political party. I and see. I think that, uh, like you said, the Saudi. Uh, the beauty of October 17th is that people from all across um, the, the decentralization of the momentum, it was a Pandora's box for everything. Yes. Uh, it was transac- uh, uh, transaction. Um, what's the word? Not transversal. Uh, transactional? Is it the word? Uh, no, uh, not transactional. Intersectional. Inter- intersectional, intersectional, yeah. Yes. <laughs> there was a se- sectional, <laughs> sectional in there. Sectional something. Intersectional. Yeah. Intersectional. <laughs> uh, and that's, I think, you know, the fact that you had LGBT uh, uh, communities being on this. I mean, I witnessed, I'll tell you a story. I witnessed it, uh, an episode of a group, I think they were called... And the anarchist at some point they emerged i don't know if you're cafe I, I don't know if or the anarchists so. and Are i you remember talking about Memphis? no family won't like that i'm joke. kidding i'm joking i mean i've had him i'm having other yeah. members oh yeah and your cousin is coming yes. munir hello munir munir good luck <laughs> uh, good luck in, in the election the good news is he's not going to see this episode until until later okay yeah so we're actually talking to him in the future from the past that's great he'll enjoy it even more (laughs) (laughs) um so i remember that episode with a protest coming from Mathaf with i think the um the rainbow flag arriving to uh muhammad al-amin mosque uh and a fight between 
one of the one of the one of the protesters that I would see on the street every day, one of the t- people who would chant mm. uh, a call and response, you know, all these chants, which, yes. by the way, I have I have thousands of hours of records as I, <laughs> I, I took sound, a soundscape <laughs> of the Sauro. That's very smart to do that, um, by the way. Yeah. Which I would love to work on at some point in the near future um, for a project. So anyway, this, this the group came in from from Mathaf and collided with a group uh, at uh, Martyr Square. And the uh, the group carrying the rainbow flag was attacked by yeah. protesters saying, you know, you, you shouldn't be here. What are you doing? We're against uh, LGBT community. And then there were f- boys and girls whom I met from Akkar who started protect, uh, protecting yeah. the LGBT yeah. group, just, saying yes. that we're all in this together. Or f- were you there? I, I was not there when I was watching on TV. Okay. I was actually I was in my home and I was watching this. And it's not, it's, it's, it's late 2019. I don't remember exactly when. Exactly. It's, yeah. I, I can't, I can't, I think it's before independence. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Right. No, I, and, and I remember hearing about this, the un, unlikely support. Yes. Yeah. And then, so, so these, these from these protesters became friends of mine. And later on the group I met like a month or two later, uh, when we started having the blackouts, I met that same group who was opposed to the uh, LGBT group at EDL, yeah. Electricité du Liban, mm. and they were camping there. And I remember really a horrible hot night without electricity and going there and seeing that same group. And I was like, so what? Ah, and they were <laughs> sitting together and I'm like, what happened? And they're like, no, we're past we're uh, past that. We're convinced everyone has the right to exist. Yeah. And I was like, this is politics. <laughs> this is public space. Yeah. This is politics. This is democracy. What the state has failed at doing for years, we're, we're doing on the ground. And this is for me a, 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 a great moment that I'll never forget. You saw a lot of the protest movement fade as well. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it has to do with just a crippling state and a crippling economy. And then the port blast. Add to that everything that went wrong in the last two and a half years that could go wrong for any society. And suddenly you have a movement that is fractured, divided, perhaps for reasons that are legitimate, perhaps at times they're petty reasons. But that October 17th appeal seems to have diluted quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And now it's trying to make its way into parliament. And you're running in Beirut too. So in your day-to-day let's say uh politics when you're reaching out Mm -hmm. to this district i'm going to just take a wild guess that this is a very very difficult district and that you're running for a very difficult seat and i don't think anyone even with their when they're a a known name i think for ed maksumi and it, I mean, he's also having a difficult time, even though he may be guaranteed a, a, mm-hmm. uh, a seat. But there's this very strange void that is the, it's happening for the first time in nearly three decades. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I think will be decided later. But you're fighting against real gravity. Mm-hmm. So in your day-to-day activities, what are the primary concerns you hear from this district? And does it extend to issues like Hariri's departure? Does it include issues like Hezbollah? Or is it more local the way I think Beirut Medinity would do politics, which is the very local, the very communal, but not necessarily sectarian, Mm -hmm. more in neighborhood neighborhood issues. And I I know little about Beirut too on the political level. Mm -hmm. I know it in terms of maybe what I what I see in billboards and what I read online, but I can't imagine it being a friendly environment to a civil society activist turned politician, with the, even with the right intentions. I can imagine it being a very hostile environment. So maybe I'm overreading it, I don't know, but whatever you can say on that. I, uh, I completely disagree. Oh, and good. my experience good. in yes. the last couple of months has been very surprising. I mean, I have not heard one voter saying that they're convinced by the status quo. Okay. So there's an uh, an awareness that is really surprising mm. and, and heartwarming to see that people are 
they're, they're, they're up for change. They say it. We want people who resemble us. And this is part of my campaign. My campaign is MPs are people like you and me. So they appeal to that to, to that because it it's I mean it's honest. Mm-hmm. I'm not selling, you know, I have no uh, motive. I uh, I'm what I say to them and when they ask why would we vote for you? Uh, we don't know you. Who are you? We've never seen you. Well, I say, well, the reason why you've never seen me is because our media networks are, you know, have alliances with, with political groups and because of electoral money. So this is one issue. The other issue is that they, a lot of them don't believe that I'm running myself because mm. I take service, I walk on the street, yes. I run uh, to class. And they're like, <laughs> anjad ente? I mean, even in a cab, I was like, you know, I was in a cab a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and I'm like, حتنتخب? انت من وين? He's like, باشورة. I said, great, حتنتخب? ايه والله سمعت بوحدة اسمها سارة ياسين بتعلم بالجامعة الأمريكية. You're kidding me. No. بالغلط. بالغلط. And he didn't know you. No. Are you, really? This uh, happened yes, in yes. a service? It did. And I'm like, really? Uh, why would you vote for her? He's like, حبيتها بتشبهني وصبية وشكلها شاغلة ودم جديد. I'm like, طب, if I tell you that this is me, he's like, no, no, no. I'm like, look at me and... Look at this is her. I like took my phone and showed him my photo. I'm like, eh, عن جد هاي أنت لا ما بسد كيف أنت بتأخذ سيرفيس. I'm like, eh, شو So I've heard you say this in different ways, and sometimes it's your own platform on Facebook that you want an MP to take service. Yeah. You want them to understand what it's like to be in the city. Yes. And I would never imagine that you're doing that because you that's how you move around. Yeah. And that while you're running, the driver would. Recognize you, not, would not recognize you, but know you. That's that's quite profound. Mm-hmm. That's actually a very lovely, uh, very local example of how this is working now. So you see your grassroots activity paying off. Yes. Does this extend to areas that are not so friendly mm-hmm. to change? And I'm sorry to make this uh, almost geographic, but let's say you wander into I don't know Cornish and Mazra, and then you go into Tarijdite. What is it like to try to reach out to voters there? Well, I've met with voters there in their homes, mm. and a lot of them have, have asked me to come after Eid, uh, me and, and Beirut Madinati and candidates. And actually, they've, they've told me to send a message to all new uh, groups and parties running. Don't be scared of coming to, to Tariq al-Jdide. Tariq mm. al-Jdide wants change. I mean, we're dealing specifically with the Beiruti Sunni community who, in their own words, they've been disappointed by... Uh, the head of the party for the last 17 years. I mean, they say it. Mm, and, yeah. and here I'm just uh, translating their, you know, I'm speaking their words. Yeah. We, we were deceived, we were deceived, we were deceived. So the, 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 the um, that, and then we want someone, we want someone yes. who speaks our concerns. And I was very surprised by the whole, um, by the Hezbollah question, which never comes up. It doesn't, it, they actually criticize um, ca- ca- candidates and, and campaigns who are putting the Hezbollah issue as the only the mm. only thing that should be the main issue behind them convincing them to vote for them. That's um, interesting. Because they say to me, uh, first, nahna, we live with, sh- we love, sh- we have Shia friends. Uh, yes, we, we, we're against Hezbollah and uh, having an armed group run, r- r- running things for us. But we don't want to. We don't want war with them because war with them means war in my building, war in my family. This is not how to go about things. So they're very aware. They're much more aware than we think. Than I thought. In, in that very difficult discussion, because I think it's hard enough to try to to try to stand up for something like the huge problem that is Hezbollah's position in Lebanon, which is beyond one MP. It's beyond, I think, m- most MPs. It's beyond, I think, unfortunately, Lebanon. But to have that huge conversation and then have a voter say, but we want to also be persuaded on other things. What are those other things that come up, at least in terms of Beirut too? Because I've had similar conversations with different candidates. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. Uh, Najat Aoun Saliba, running in Shouf. Uh, 
she was very it was actually a nice way of describing it she said she was surprised that sometimes the voters are not comfortable opening up quickly because there has to be some trust yes. first and then and this is very slow but then it happens and then that's where the concerns come up um Fuad Makhzoumi, who was sitting here last night, said the same. Said the uh, complete opposite of what you said, which I think is it's quite interesting. It's almost like you can hear two opposite versions of the mm-hmm. same district. He said, "No, the Hezbollah is coming up all the time, and that is a central issue." But I think he probably just did not go the step further, meaning that, and there's other things too mm-hmm. you have to talk about. Maybe it's something he just he didn't bring it up the way you're bringing it up, which I appreciate. Um, I had uh, Verena Al Amil mm-hmm. running in Metin, and she explained it in a way that Metin is just like the rest of the country, mm-hmm. that everyone's sharing in their problems, and it's not local; it's it's actually national. But you're breaking up a certain way, a certain angle, and I like it. Is it frustrations in Beirut too, mm-hmm. or is it Lebanese problems that are pervading all of us? It depends. So this is where I I think, what kind of social group are you addressing? So I've been mm. uh, I've been meeting people who are living in Damour and Naame, Beirut two voters in um, other other Ebshamoun, Aramoun. Yes. So they all have the same aspirations and worries. They want their rights. I mean, some of them, and I think we you know I work with them on that process. Some of them first say, "Oh, خدمات, services. Right. And I try to say, well, the MP is someone who drafts laws and policies and we monitor we monitor the work of the minist- ministries who are the one who would find a solution for electricity, for water, for transportation, um, for the financial crisis. So there's I think they're what, used to you offering them to solve their medical bills exactly every, yes, or like yeah. can you find a job to my you know and I think yeah. they're not to blame what who is to blame are these are these militias turned political parties who have you know um crafted and ingrained this and, and, and perhaps this is something that you know clientelism sectarian clientelism is older um going back to uh, to readings and and family discussions with my mother and father and but I think this has been, you know, entrenched deeply in the last 30 to 40 years, especially after the war. So they're used to see an MP like uh, a godfather yeah. who is there to uh, go to funerals and weddings and religious communal uh, events and to provide jobs and tuition and etc. So what we're providing and I tell them that and we are here changing that given and mm. we are here to and they listen you know mm. and i say hanna zalluk on zalluna 30 years they've made us you know ask them for services that the state which is them today because we elect them should be providing to you and to me and when you say that really i was at a gathering in naamel last week and the conversation shifted from why why should i be mm. Uh, mm. why should i help you in your uh, election campaign to, yes, you're right. And I started getting messages. You're right. What you say is right. But Maslina, you represent me. And this is really heartwarming. And this is in, you know, one uh, one uh, social group and one community. And now if you shift to the bigger question, which is the, the Hezbollah question and the Shia community, I mean, I had the privilege and the chance to meet so many Shia um, rebels, let's say <laughs> say it this way, in October 17. And I've witnessed a lot of them being uh, beaten and, and bullied by their parents and communities or the leader of the neighborhood. And even all these times when we had the Shabib al-Khanda yes. coming yeah. in, actually, on the ring, and on the ring yeah. I had informants in from the Khanda, from friends and 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 close friends who ha- who were in the Saudi saying to me, Sarah, actually, they're not coming from Khanda because I'm watching, I'm on my balcony and I know what's happening. And all of these voices, and for me, wh- yes, Hezbollah is a regional problem and, and a geopolitical problem, but we're not doing our part to start dealing with it. And I think supporting these 
um, Shia voices which are saying we're not Sunni. Please don't call us Sunni Shia. I say Hezbollah and Amal. They don't represent me. Yeah. Um, and I've met people in Beirut and voters, and I've met people in the Beka and in Jnub, and I went to visit them specifically, and they said we we like you because your 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 approach. We want people who resemble us. We want people who have who who we can trust, and we don't trust them. So we want to give you our voice. Beirut Medinity fought for the things that I really, I mean, it resonates with me deeply. You want sidewalks. <laughs> you want you want to preserve public space, whether it's Raushi. You want Al-Hurish to remain open permanently, not for a few foreigners that have exclusive rights. And to a certain degree, it is open now, but maybe not the best of ours. Uh, the library that has opened as well. But I mean, Beirut Medinity was talking about this long ago. Uh, the incinerator, that didn't happen, thankfully. But in terms of even public transport, uh, bicycle lanes, the things that I would love to see in Beirut, environmental concerns, uh, a, a gentle city to live in, not a, not a pressure cooker every day. For me... I see the wall hitting all those issues as the same wall that hits the Lebanese state and that has paralyzed us. And this is an it's a it's an unpopular way of maybe looking at everything in one sort of one one side, but I think the fact that Lebanon is still in a problem that's causing us pain and suffering and violence and war and i think the august port blast is the biggest example of that the smallest concerns don't work Mm -hmm. now do you see things that way that there's a fundamental problem that has to be solved for that the good intentions of whether it's you or anyone pursuing politics that they could materialize one day or do you read the room differently that you can focus on the local and wait for those other things to fade if they do. No, I think you do both at the same time. You do it uh, intersectionally, transversally. Um, Hezbollah is a problem. It's a big, big problem. Um, and what I was saying and w- what you pointed to is that, you know, in your, um, and I listened to other podcasts, your take is that to put things in words in your mouth. It's a it's a problem that is regional beyond me and you and, and Lebanon, perhaps. And it kills us, and too. And it kills us. Totally agree. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we've done our part in, re- in addressing it, mm. uh, whether it's by centralization, which has deprived the South, mm. whether it's by the uh, uh, unclear positioning of all the political parties from since the withdrawal of the Israeli army from South Lebanon mm. to 2006 and Sabah uh, Ayar, May May 7th, yes. to the uh, coalition of uh, the Lebanese forces to uh, with Ba'on, uh, I mean, yes. to the Ahad, to that lovely uh, agreement, the Marm Khail agreement, I mean, we, they've all danced with the lovely with Madam Khail agreement. That should be the name, <laughs> that should be the title <laughs> of their book. That should they should just publish it tomorrow. You think? The lovely Madam <laughs> Khail agreement. I don't think they would even buy it. <laughs> it's a nice title. <laughs> um, so they've all danced with that uh, with that devil with that hmm. with them and and again I I reiterate that any. Any state, any 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 people ha- have have everyone has a right to resist occupation, and I'm not uh, decreasing from the legitimacy of of resistance to uh, foreign occupation or invasion. But there's a time when uh, you know a guerrilla army takes a, tr- and I think we've uh, and perhaps at the time. The belief was that if they're integrated in politics, then this would resolve or regionally. Yeah. And I think this was a mistake. Uh, and I think themselves, Hezbollah and Amal, I mean, there's so many 
issues between both, whether it's based on economic reasons, uh, where now, you know, one one group is, is being able to pay members or um, um, partisans in, in dollars, the other feeling that, you know, they're, they're, they're becoming even more deprived. So internal, so divide and conquer. Yes. And I think we should shed light on that. And I'm all f- for the divide and conquer because this weakens them. We need to support and and protect and push forward uh, rebellious uh, voices and um, provide them with what i mean they're more brave than me Mm. Uh, Mm. because they have a lot to lose and and for me i say that to everyone that the real saura now is in the south the real saura the real revolution now is these two three lists in south lebanon who are fearless and who are who, who could be you know who could be threatened or who, who could face serious uh, uh, danger, which is not the case here. So I, I think for me, you know, running is a piece of cake. What, <laughs> what I mean, the criticism is, you know, you're, you're, you're going against uh, Saad al-Hariri. Okay, if I'm, my answer is like, no, I'm not going against him. He, he and his party have decided not to run. Mm-hmm. So, and it's my right to be running. Yeah. So I think... Two, three things to finish it's your, on. It's on your right Hezbollah. to run with or without him. With, with yeah, or absolutely. without him. Yeah. And it's your right as a voter to have me or him or someone else as an option. Yeah. So for, for, uh, for Shia communities who are against Hezbollah and Amal or not finding themselves represented, we owe them a new representation. And we're here to say, me and others and colleagues in the South and, and all across, you have an alternative. We hear you. We're here. Trust us, uh, and 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 we need to encourage you. And also, I think, for me, I mean, Hezbollah has to take a decision. Either they're within the state, and they understand that a state should be sovereign, and they accept all these policies that we want to push forward. And I think what would weaken them is the independent judiciary law. If we are able, me or other colleagues, if we are able to push for it as a first priority within the legal, uh, within the legal co- uh, committees today, because this would be a blow to them. Today, the, the Stara al-Bitar was a threat to that entity. And how about you have a document that says, this is, this is how we uh, hold people accountable. And you guys, you're either with that or you're not. And if you're not, then let us reassess and take a different strategy. I wouldn't have thrown in one other thing, but I'm going to because you opened the door gently to something that I think is extremely important. It's absolutely the right path to pursue. An independent judiciary, somebody, I think anyone who stands up for reform today should scream loud and clear that this is a key demand. We're both old enough. And we were both maybe, for better or worse, I don't know if we're lucky in this in this world, uh, to know what Hamra is like when a decision is taken against Hezbollah. And May 2008, this was a war zone. You grew up in this neighborhood. I still think of myself as a Ras Beirut, even though I moved to Marim Khair, the lovely Marim Khair. But uh, I was hiding underneath a... Uh, I was in next to Mekhfar Hbesh, the old music school that was turned into a youth hostel, once r- rented out by Kamel Salibi himself, mm-hmm. we were hiding underneath an, a piano yeah. that was left there after the Civil War because there were snipers and there were RPG. There was mortar fire. For three nights, we hid, and Hamra was a war zone because the state took a decision against Hezbollah's infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Fast forward 14 years later, I don't know why that group would act any differently to anyone trying to do the same thing. October last year, in Tayuni, Tarib Bitar, in his last stand, decided to show us all where the limit is to an independent judge. And the response was violence. Mm -hmm. It didn't turn into another May 2008, but it's a very small version of that story. It's been seven months. That whole investigation has been stalled. I still don't know why an MP or a group of MPs or a coalition or whatever, a Mm -hmm. bloc, Mm -hmm. would have any leverage in making this 
issue making Hezbollah act any differently. I, I don't see that. One word, courage. Tari Bittar is full of courage. But he, he's alone. The state tried to take down cameras and dislodge a telecoms network that was running parallel to the state in 2008. A complete takeover mm -hmm. of Habra. Sure. So would courage prevent Hezbollah's motives? I think, I mean, their motives, it's up to them to define their motives based on the changes and the situation they're, they're, they're in. Mm -hmm. And it's up to them to decide, are they part are they part of the Lebanese community? Are they part of, of Lebanon? And if yes, what is it that they want? I mean, would they want to be their own thing? Uh, and how would they deal with issues of identity, of borders? And I'd, what, what annoys me with them is that they're one foot in, one foot out. They want you, but they don't, they don't want you. They love you, but they hate you. And I think courage, by courage, I mean being really independent, having people who are inside and outside, and uh, it's not, it's it's not it's multi-layered. Mm. It's having all these layers working together, uh, pushing for uh, civic education in Khanda Al Hami in in Kfar uh, Al together with uh, meeting the laid. So I'll tell you a story. Last year. I love your time. stories, by the way. You are a good storyteller. <laughs> I'm glad you started the episode this way because you are. Great. I like your stories. Yeah. Actually, I, I really like them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so first time I go picking olives and I called two friends, Tante Marie and Zgherta <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Hajj M. Jihad. Zgherta? Uh, no, I don't know. And both of them said, Sara Habib, you're in the And this is not... Uh, it's not a cliche. It's yeah. not a cliche. These two women working in the same rural landscape, okay, recognize the same plants, the same asparagus, the same khabbeze. So there is something that is common. And I think, so I asked Sit, Sit, Sit Jihad in, in, in Jnoub <laughs> because she votes in my district and I went to visit her. And she said, I wish I could vote for you, but I cannot, uh, you know, I trust Sayyid Hassan. So, but I want to vote for you. You know, if I could only vote for you, I would vote for you and the others. And if you talk to her, you know, you, the discussion moves in circles. Mm. And I think it's really based on fear, on distrust. And I tell her, fine, but, you know, why is that? And she's like, they protected me. I was about to die many times, me and my kids in the South. And they protected me. And you in Beirut or Beirutis, you don't know what this means. So I think it's our responsibility if we want to disarm them, we, we need to disarm them from within and the change will come from within them. It's not me at parliament with all the efforts that I can do or regionally. Uh, all these efforts need to work at the same time to get somewhere. You know, I actually appreciate the emphasis you're applying on individuals in this story because I think the way you describe this one one woman explain to you why she is voting for another team but she would vote for you had this issue been solved meaning that there's still a reason why she's leaning one way when there's an alternative that's what she deep down wants to vote for i think and i maybe i'm being too skeptical here i think you could have the entire community against hezbollah and we would still have this machine in lebanon I don't think their popularity is that big. Mm -hmm. I think it's declined across the country, and it's declined within that community as well. And I think it wasn't ever that strong to begin with. This is a forced reality. And I think a lot of communities have let go of their Civil War era anxieties. I'm, I don't think you could have 90% of Shia in Lebanon wanting Hezbollah to reform mm -hmm. and Hezbollah would still be an Iranian asset in Lebanon and I think that's a reality beyond local elections maybe I'm reading that the wrong way but assuming part of that at least is is real 
I still appreciate that you're emphasizing a journey that should happen with or without Iran's needs in Lebanon. Mm-hmm. And that you shouldn't avoid that topic. There's no excuse to mm. simply go home and not do mm. politics. Mm. And I think there's something to be said there. That when this temperature and the region does cool down enough, you want the right people in power. And you're young. We're young. One year apart. Uh, I'd like to see someone like you or anyone with your intention uh, part of the state. Not just in civil society or your friend who suggested for you to run. He's right. Mm. That That's the reason to run. And I wish you the best in these coming two weeks. You're generous with your time. You gave me more time than we agreed to. And an evening that you could be campaigning, but you're stuck with me instead. And um, there's an audience built in that's tuned in. Many are voting in Lebanon and abroad. But I, I, I think uh, a lot of Lebanese, uh, at times, they want to hear a slow and very intimate exploration. Mm-hmm of why you're running. And I think we did this successfully tonight. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Rooney. We'll do the official handshake. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, you promised that there would be money in- included in this uh, catalog? Money t- 10 years from now. 10 years from now. So you can keep that as an archive. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's lovely. <laughs> Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>